Um, I'm getting through this a little faster than I thought. We're going to talk about today um, one mechanism of overpressure, and then we'll talk about some more next time, okay? So we, we saw that overpressure exists. I mean, those last two plots were real data, but let's talk a little bit about how it exists or ways you can develop overpressure, okay? And so the most common and probably the most understood is this um, idea of disequilibrium compaction, okay? And so the idea here is that the ongoing sedimentation increases the vertical stress faster than the fluid can diffuse, okay? So if you imagine that you had a, if you imagine you had a well-connected, you know, sedimentary layer, say sand, okay? And it's well connected and there's fluid distributed through it throughout. And then due to some sedimentation process, you begin to build up layers on top of it. If this is such that the layers are either you know, developing the sedimentation and cementing in a, in a way that's fast enough that the fluid can't diffuse through it. Um, so, you know, as this is going on, you will have fluid permeating these layers, right? But if this sedimentation continues to increase at a rate faster than that diffusion can occur, then you can achieve an overpressure scenario. Because what happens is I'm building up layer on top of it, increasing the vertical stress, right? I'm basically adding weight on top, increasing the vertical stress, and the fluid is not equilibriating. And at the same time as the, as the vertical stress is in being increased, and I'm pushing on the rock below it, and that pressure, well, that, you know, the physical weight of the, of the sediment on top <coughs> can actually cause the pores to collapse, right? So I'm squeezing the pores, and the fluid is not being allowed to diffuse away fast enough, and that can cause this sort of disequilibrium compaction. And so, you know, the, the characteristic time that of the diffusion process in a porous media is given by this equation. I'll talk about what the terms are, but let's just start um, somewhere. Just like I think I've said in this cl in this class, you know, whenever you're trying to solve a mechanics problems and you don't know what else to do, start with F equals ma, right? Well, <coughs> if you're trying to solve a petroleum reservoir problem and you don't know what else to do, what should you start with? Okay, mass balance is, a g is fine. I, I, something even simpler than that, maybe. Sort of the F equals MA of petroleum engineering. Darcy's law, maybe. So if you don't know what else to do, start with Darcy's law, right? So, so Darcy's law is <coughs> like the fluid velocity. Here, let me uh, just use a black. So the fluid velocity is equal to, and we're just going to do this in 1D, okay? So the permeability over the viscosity. I know we always use uh, mu for the viscosity, but for some reason, this came, I, I want to be consistent with Zoback's book, in case you're following along, and he uses eta, so I'm going to use eta, okay? So that's the, just the fluid viscosity. times the uh, change in pressure, or the partial derivative of pressure with respect to x in 1D, where x is the direction of interest. <coughs> All right, uh, I know there, there, there may be an area term here. We're just going to talk about it through, a, through any unit area, OK? So this is the velocity of the fluid. Well, what is, I'm trying to think of what is, um, 
Can you describe a velocity in, in words? Like in the, the velocity of a particle or something? So. Well, okay, Me meters per second, that's one way to start, right? But so I'm thinking like in terms of, you know, it's, it's the distance traveled divided by a time, right? That, that's sort of what, meters per second. Distance traveled divided by a time. So we're going to be interested in some characteristic distance, okay, divided by some characteristic time. Right. So tau is this characteristic time that appears in that equation over there, and L is some characteristic distance. It's some distance that I'm interested in traveling to, right? And so if we just essentially solve this equation, for tau, then we get tau is equal to um, Okay, um, at the same time, I'm going to sort of use a finite difference of this guy. Right? So the, the, the change in pressure with respect to x, well, the x that we're interested in is also this characteristic distance, okay? So we're going to sort of finite difference this and say that that's the change in pressure over L, okay, over this characteristic distance. And then, then plug that in and solve for tau. And we get this guy. Okay. So now let's take a brief aside. We'll come back. If I have a little piece of material, this is distance x, and I apply some stress to this such that I deform it. So this, this original distance, we'll call it LO, and I'm going to deform, I'm going to apply a stress and I'm going to deform this guy so that it has a new distance L. Right? So then from your solid mechanics class, what is the strain? What, what strain did I apply to that thing? Remember the definition of strain? Delta L over L, Delta L, over L okay. And then just depending on what sign convention you want to have, then you just, you know, it's, it's L minus L0 or L0 minus L, just depending on if you want to have positive strains in compression or negative strains. So we're, we're, we're going to use a positive in compression sign convention. So we'll have L0 over L divided by L0. That's our strain, of course. And if we were to plot this, this strain versus the applied stress, for a linear elastic material, I'd get a curve that looked like that, right, in one dimension. And the slope of this curve, what's the slope of the curve, the slope of the stress-strain curve? What's the name of it? Hmm? Young's modulus, elastic modulus, right? So we typically use E for that. So that's, you know, that's something you, you all should have seen. The next part you may or may not have seen, but it's just an extension of that concept to 3D, right? So in 3D, we have a cube. Okay. I'm going to apply a stress equally on all sides. magnitude like that. And it would, you know that's going to deform it into some smaller cube. And so the 
you know, stress and strain are tensors, of course, right? But in this case, I'm applying a stress that's equal on all sides, right? So my stress, te my stress tensor is going to be just, you know, let's use H here or something. I'm just applying it normal to each side, so there's no shear stresses. So this is my stress tensor. And likewise, uh, the, strain, the strain tensor would be something similar. Um, now, if I apply an equal stress to all sides, am I going to get equal strains? So are all those equal to one another? Maybe not, right? Because there's this thing called a Poisson effect. So may maybe not. Um, but anyway, essentially what I can do is I can uh, I can I can give you I can say that the um, I shouldn't have used uh, let's just I'll just use this that the, the sort of average normal stress is equal to one third uh, the trace one third the trace of the tensor so in that case just sigma h sigma h sigma h so that just equals sigma h, right? And likewise, then, I'd say that there's some, um, and so if I were to plot this, I'd also get a straight line. And what is the slope of that? Not the Young's modulus. But the bulk modulus. So the bulk modulus is the characteristic strength of the material if I apply it in a hydrostatic compression. Okay. So <clears throat> now just as a final thing before we go back, let's imagine that I apply a hydrostatic, a change in hydrostatic stress equal to delta P and a change in hydrostatic strain equal to 1, then I then I'd have the equation just according to this same thing, delta P over 1 is equal to K, right, the bulk modulus. <clears throat> Does anybody know what 1 over the bulk modulus is? It's a term that's more familiar in, in petroleum engineering. It's the compress, compress, compressibility, right, compressibility. So if I just invert this relationship, 1 over delta P is then beta, the compressibility. Right? So remember this equation, and we're going to go back. We have 1 over delta P there. So then we have the compressibility. And then, of course, we can split the compressibility. That's the total compressibility of the fluid-solid system. right? And so then if we split it and we say, okay, we have the porosity of the rock, which is fluid filled, right? So the porosity of the rock has fluid in it, so it's the porosity of the rock times the bulk, the compressibility of the fluid plus the compressibility of the rock times mu L squared over K. Right, so that's where that equation comes from. It's really just Darcy's law. And then 
Darcy's Law with an interest in you know, how long, what's the characteristic time scale for some, <coughs> for some characteristic length scale, okay? So we can use this equation to estimate you know, how long it takes for the fluid to diffuse So for a low permeability sand, which has one millidarcy, then tau is on the order of years for L equal to 100 meters. Okay, so 100 meters could be the, a reasonable size of a, of a cap or isolation, sedimentary isolation region. Right? So on the order of years, so it only took a few years for the pore pressure to equilibrate. And in that case, it's just going to be well connected and you're going to see hydrostatic pressures. Okay. However, in a low permeable shell, which has a 10 nano Darcy, right, then tau is on the order of 100,000 years or 100 meters, right, which is sort of what we know. I mean, you know, it takes, even for natural gas, I mean, here we're talking about water, but even for natural <laughs> gas in a shale, it takes, shale is so impermeable, right? It takes one natural gas molecule one year to migrate one meter in a shale. It's very, very impermeable material. That's why we have to stimulate it somehow to produce it. Um, so this is an actual well in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so here's some gamma ray logs and other stuff. But essentially, the point is, um, the point of this is just to show that this is actual data from this well in the Gulf of Mexico and shows this sort of overpressure region uh, at depth. Uh, so now to re just return to that question. Why, why do we always, why is it very common to see this overpressure in the Gulf of Mexico, knowing what you know about this equilibrium compaction now? And th this equilibrium compaction, remember, <coughs> is that you have sediment moving in faster than the fluid can diffuse. So why does this happen in the Gulf of Mexico? No. Why does it happen in the Atlantic Ocean? The Mississippi River. That's exactly why it happens. The Mississippi River can lay down some sediment. So, anyway. Okay, so next time we'll talk about other mechanisms <coughs> for that increase of pore pressure.